is Heritage Words, a podcast about how we engage with our ancestral languages in new and creative ways. Heritage Words is produced by the HUCJIR Jewish Language Project, which raises awareness about Jewish ancestral diversity through the lens of language. I'm your host, Sarah Bunin Benor. Today, we're talking to Ilana Mansharov. Ilana is a Jewish educator who lives in Toronto, and her ancestral languages include Juhuri, Hebrew, and English. And uh, Ilana, I'll be asking you about your ancestors and those languages, but first I wanna know a little bit more about you. Tell us where you grew up and what you do now. Hi everyone, uh, I was born and raised in Israel, um, what you call it, Sabarit. Uh, my parents were born outside of Israel and I'm the first generation to be born in Israel. Uh, when I was a teenager, our family moved from Israel uh, to Canada uh, to for uh, other for educational purposes and uh, we've been living here since uh, my parents were children themselves and when they immigrated made Aliyah to Israel in the early 70s with their parents and uh, that's how they made their journey from Ruba Azerbaijan to Israel and I made my journey from Israel uh, to Toronto in Canada. Okay, so your family is from Cuba, Azerbaijan. And um, can you tell us a little bit about the Juhuri language? Yes, so uh, my grandparents and my parents were born in Ruba, in Azerbaijan, which is called also Rirmizik uh, Khasaba, which is called the Red Village. And uh, they spoke a Judea the Judea Tat language, Juhuri, which is uh, Hebrew, um, mixed with Persian, mixed with Turkish a little bit, and even uh, some words in Russian. And that was their first language. That was the language they spoke at home. Uh, because they lived in Azerbaijan, they used to go to uh, Azerbaijan schools, which means that they learned Turkish. And uh, because Azerbaijan was under uh, the Soviet Union uh, rule back then, then they also learned Russian. So uh, my parents were trilingual <laughs> since they were uh, very, very young. And uh, when they immigrated to Israel, they started learning Hebrew and, uh, and English as well. So um, they're very much fluent in, in uh, six to seven languages. Wow. So what was the language of your home when you were growing up in Israel? So... Um, when my parents got married, the first two years of their marriage was uh, with uh, my grandparents. So my first language is Juhuri for the first two years of my life. And then uh, my parents moved uh, to become an independent couple and have their own family. And then uh, about two, when I was two years old, we switched to Hebrew. And how old were you when you moved to America? Uh, when I moved to Toronto, I was 13, 13 years old. Okay. So when you moved to Toronto, um, you were fluent in Hebrew. Would you say you were still fluent in Juhuri? Juhuri, uh, we spoke with uh, my grandparents' Juhuri mainly. Uh, speaking meaning that they spoke entirely in Juhuri and we kind of answered in Hebrew. <laughs> but we understood that language 100%. Um, when I became an adult, um, that's when I started using Juhuri as a spoken language with my parents. Um, it was in order for um, my kids not to understand, also have like a secret language because nobody in Toronto understood uh, Juhuri around our area. So it was, um, it was a secret language for, between me and my parents. Um, because we were, I would say, with my grandparents, it's, uh, it was something that they felt comfortable with, but we did not feel comfortable uh, speaking Juhuri when we were children. But we were kind of looking for it when we were adults. We were kind of looking for the roots and going back and, uh, and revitalizing that language that we kind of uh, almost forgot. Wow. And so tell me more about that process of switching to... Juhuri, when you're speaking to your parents, did you uh, 
tell them that this is what you want to do? How did they respond? Well, when it was when I was first speaking Juhuri with them, of course they were laughing because my accent is is a little bit more Israeli or or uh, Canadian for them. Um, but they understood the importance of uh, of preserving the language, and so we practiced a lot. And uh, and I would say, fast forwarding a few lays, years later, about two years uh, ago, I lost uh, my last grandparent, uh, living la uh, grandparent, and it kind of hit both of us, my parents and I that we're letting go of a whole culture, a whole heritage, a whole history uh, by not preserving it. And that generation, my grandparents' generation is gone. And what do we have out of it other than our stories and our memories of them? So uh, it's kind of when we had a conversation, my parents and I together, we, uh, we decided that we should be doing more, absolutely doing more. Mm, wow. And before that, did you use a lot of Juhuri words when you were speaking Hebrew with your parents? Um, when we used, uh, it's a word here and there, um, just to um, to say something so that my kids wouldn't understand, um, then we would use it, but not in full sentences unless we actually have a conversation. Um, so yeah, and absolutely calling uh, our grandparents with uh, in a jury names and those are the words I would love to to um, speak about as well sure. is the family unit <laughs> yeah so let's do that let's talk about the words the heritage words that you are sharing with your children yes yeah, so when when um let's see so when my kids were born, so I'm the eldest of four, and uh, my children are the first grandchildren uh, in the family, and they know how to call Saba and Safta in Hebrew, which means grandfather, grandmother and grandfather, but when my grandparents are still alive, they didn't, we said, what are they going to call them? So then we started using um, the day, which means mother. But um, use use the day also for for calling a grandmother. So they started calling my grandparents, my grandmothers, the day Wuza and the day Tomora, which are my grand uh, grandmothers, and also Bebe. Bebe means father. Um, so for my dad, they used to call they call him Saba. Um, but when my grandfathers were uh, alive they used to say Bebe Pinchos and Bebe Yako. Okay so they had kinship terms from mm -hmm. Juhuri and how aware were they that these are words from Juh Juhuri? They knew it was different than Hebrew <laughs> but the actually knowing that Juhuri came later on in life uh, when they were I would say around 10, 11 years old, they understood that it's that it's Juhuri and they understood that it's another language as we speak. And so was that a conscious conversation that you initiated with your children? Uh, at the beginning, it started when they were babies. So it was, um, they just kind of, you know, uh, did what they were told. Um, but when we started speaking with my husband and I started speaking with with our children, they kind of understood also the importance of uh, calling them in those kinship names, and um, and how important it is also. And and I think they thought that it was cool to uh, to speak another language that uh, not everybody kind of knows. <laughs> in yeah. Yeah. How old are your kids now? So my children are 21, 15, and 11. Okay. And what other words do they know from Juhuri? So in, in the whole uh, Mishpach um, vocabulary, there's also, it's very interesting in Juhuri, uh, the maternal and the paternal are kind of separated. So I'm still going to start with the paternal side. When you call um, uh, paternal grandparents are called Kela de day, grandpa. Kela de day means um, great grand uh, 
a grandmother. And Kela Bebe means a grandfather. And Kela means big or grand. Um, in the maternal side, uh, you would call a grandmother Dede Cholu. And Cholu means an uncle from the maternal side. So if you try to contrast or uh, the two, Kela Dede and Dede Cholu. So you're referring to um, the maternal grandparents because um, with connection to the uncle, which is another patriarch. Um, and uh, to say a grandfather is Bebe Cholu in, in the maternal side and in the paternal side is Kela Bebe. So there's, there's a bit of a difference there. And also um, uncle and aunt. In the paternal side, ama means an aunt, and chola means uh, an aunt on the maternal side. And uh, an uncle is lela. And as we said before, cholu is an uncle on the maternal side. Uh, so those words my kids know, and we use that as well, um, in order to also give respect to, um, to uh, grand uncles and aunts. Uh, the words cha'ar, which means um, sister, biro, which means brother, um, also is related to cousins. Um, the words cousin, because cha'ar uh, zora means the offspring of a cha'ar, which is a sister. And biro zora means an offspring of a brother. So uh, the Yes, a lot of connection with just very simple words. And, um, but, but there's a lot of difference between maternal and paternal. Yeah, so that makes sense that you would use a lot of kinship terms, especially when the relationships differ in Juhuri than in the English. I'm assuming your, your children are, are speaking English and Hebrew also? Yeah, yeah. They, uh, they speak Hebrew and they speak English at home. Okay. <laughs> Um, and so you, you're married, right? Yes. Um, and tell us about your husband's family. So my husband's family is also, uh, they're also Juhuo. Um, my uh, my uh, grandparents came from Ruba. His, uh, his family came from Khochmaz, which is also in Azerbaijan. And um, they, uh, my family immigrated made Aliyah to Israel in the 70s. His family made Aliyah right early in the 90s. Um, and um, and he tells me about, uh, he remembers, uh, he was a child, he was very small. and But he still remembers the, the journey to Israel. Mind you, when, because uh, Azerbaijan was under the Soviet unit back then, um, everybody who was living to Israel had to live in secrecy um, through the Jewish agency, which means the journey was very long. It took weeks and they took train rides to many cities in Europe and uh, eventually ended up in Vienna after I would say two weeks of a journey in trains with all their children and all their belongings. And in Vienna, the Jewish agency flew them to Tel Aviv. So uh, for my husband's side uh, of the family, he very much remembers that journey and how, how long it was and uh, how scary it was also to leave, uh, to leave your home, to leave your home in secret and to come to this uh, new country, uh, which they always thought was very special uh, because um, there is a saying, uh, which means the land of our ancestors. and. Um, and the uh, Juhuro were always Zionist, and they always think, uh, they always had that dream of going back to, to Hori Bebeho, to the land, to the Holy Land. And uh, for him, it was very exciting, but also very scary at the same time. So did you meet him in America? I mean, Canada, sorry, I did. <laughs> North, meet him in Canada? Yes, yeah, funny, because uh, we, we met here in, uh, in Toronto out of all places <laughs> but we have and, so much in common yeah when you met him did you know that he was Juhuro before you uh started talking to him yes I knew uh 
because uh, we were kind of set up on a blind date as so I got some information about him. And uh, I know we were the same from the same background, um, but I didn't know we'll get well. So we had an amazing conversation right off the bat. And um, both of us know how important it is also to come from very traditional Jew uh, family and to keep the tradition going as much as we can uh, for the next generations to come. Wow. So you speak to each other in what, a combination of Hebrew and English? So we speak to each other in Juhuri when we don't want the kids to understand, but they are picking up on the language. It's been, <laughs> the little one is 11. So he's been hearing words here and there. They kind of can figure it out. <laughs> um, we try, <laughs> um, but um, but they're, they're figuring it out. But we speak in Hebrew mostly at home and uh, and some uh, Juhuri vocabulary. Yes. Wow. Okay. So aside from the kinship terms, what are some other words that you frequently use in Juhuri with your children when you do want them to understand? So um, there are, in, in Juhuri, there's so many words that are blessings. They're so positive. And that's what fascinates me about some of the words we use all the time, um, such as Hubi. Hubi means good. Sorboshi, sorboshi means thank you, but the word, the root of the word sorboshi means uh, may you live a long life because sor sorry means life, and boshi means may you be like may you be alive, um, and it's only as adults you realize that these words are so special <laughs> and they're they're very much blessings, so we use those words in the house. Um, words that I use with my kids that are in jewelry is Shirin Abala, which means sweet child. Um, John Bala, which means my, John comes from the word June, which means my soul. And uh, it means my dear child or my, my soul. Um, and words as in greetings, uh, we use, we say, um, if you want to say hello, we say Shalom. <laughs> in the accent, but there's also words such as uh, which means may you have a good day, and that's how you greet people, other than shalom. And I love the word which means goodbye, kind of. When you leave, you say and really means, it's another blessing, it means God may help, may God help, and tiro comes from the word Torah, which means um, tiro kume comes together. May God help us. May the Torah, the um, learning from the Torah help us, the lessons from the Torah. Mm. So it's several terms of endearment mm -hmm. and several greetings. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And and thank you. I like that. So so do you uh, use the word thank you, Sochboshi? So uh, do you use that with your children and do they say it back? Yes, they do say it back. They, they love that it's different than it's not the Hebrew or the English that they used to. It's uh, when I say it, it's like their lies light up. Oh, I know that one. Wow. <laughs> and, I, and I know what it means. And they say it back. Yes. And do they share these words with their friends who are not from a Juhuro background? I don't think they're that comfortable to share it with. Um, but they do have, um, they do have, they do, my kids go to public school. All their Jewish education is uh, given to them from home and from my grandparents' home. And uh, we chose public school for our children because we wanted them to be open to other, uh, to other cultures as well. And they do have Persian friends. <laughs> and sometimes they would say uh, the, the, the numbers. In, in Juhuri is the same sort of numbers in Persian and uh, and they would share that. So that's something they do share with their friends. Yeah, and also the word June or John is in Persian as well, right? John's right, yeah. Do you, when you hear Persian, can you understand it? My parents understand it completely and they can have a conversation with Persian people even though they only know Juhuri. Um, I understand, I can understand it completely, but speaking it, I'm not that conf confident yet. 
So it's also something feel, that it is mutually, sorry, you do feel that it is mutually intelligible, right? That Persian and Juhuri are similar enough that you can understand each other, basically. Yes, I would say from all the languages that are mixed up in Juhuri, Persian, I would say, is more dominant than the other ones. Yeah, and I think it relates to the historical Persian Empire having extended over a large territory, including Azerbaijan, where your family is from, and also including uh, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. We have another guest on our podcast who speaks Bukharian or who has Bukharian as a heritage language. And that is similar. She also mentioned the word Jun or John uh, as a term of endearment that's common in her Bukharian community. Oh, I think that's good to know. Yeah, we all come from the same region. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what about community? When you were growing up in Israel and then in Canada, to what extent were you part of a Juhuro community? So in Israel, we were very much, uh, my parents at least, uh, we were children, but my parents were very much involved in the Juhuri community. It was a very tight community in Israel. And uh, you get invited to each other's uh, simchas, uh, smachot, and um, and celebrate together. And we lived in the neighborhood where we lived. There was uh, many, many Jewel. Um, so as children, before we left to Canada, um, we were very much involved in the Jewish community, Jewel. And then what about in Canada? So in Canada, the, Jew, the Jew, uh, Jewelry community is very small compared to other places. Um, but because they're very small, they also try to keep um, to keep um, going into each other's also smachot. Um, I would say when we moved to Canada in the mid 90s, the, it was very tight, very small, very tight. But as children grew and the community kind of grew out, and uh, demographics changed in the Jewish uh, community here. We kind of, everybody kind of kept to themselves. And uh, it is a tiny community, uh, but we kind of know each other. Yeah, and what about your kids? Do you, do they have any Juhuro friends? Other than their cousins <laughs> uh, and my cousins. Um, no, I don't know. They don't. Do you think most of their friends are Ashkenazi or from other backgrounds? So uh, most of their Jewish friends are Ashkenazi and there is some um, Mizrahi and some Sephardic. Right. And so they go to public schools, so they probably interact with kids from all different backgrounds as well. From all different backgrounds, yes. Yeah. And, and I think that's what Israel is. I mean, we're all Jews kind of, but we all came from, I remember just living in our building in Israel. Um, we lived in a four story building and in each floor you can find two families from different kinds of places in the world, but they're all Jews. So we grew up with that multiculturalism, even though it was Jewish. And, um, and the community here in Toronto is very much multicultural as well. And it kind of reminds me of the way that I grew up with different cultures and, and sharing those different cultures. And, um, and that's what we wanted to give to our children as well. Mm. And in Toronto, do, do they have any opportunity to uh, learn Juhuri beyond conversations with you and your parents? No. And that's what one of my... Um, one of the visions that I have is to create one. So it's kind of creating um, a culture that's diminishing and bringing it back with, uh, with uh, some learning, some educational programs or projects that we can, uh, we can develop. And uh, there is hope <laughs> because there are, I think there's enough of us here in Toronto to be, to be creating a project like that. And um, I'm looking forward to exploring more and seeing how we can actually bring it to action. Wow. So you're thinking of starting some kind of organization that will teach Juhuri? Yes. 
I would definitely love to uh, establish um, an organization, uh, a nonprofit organization that would uh, that the projects would be one of them would be uh, an actual curriculum to teach jewelry, an educational program, and also an educational program that teaches about uh, the jewelry culture through the arts, through the music, through the culinary arts, through uh, fine arts. Um, any connections that we can uh, we can have people relate to, and I would love I would love to research more and make connections there and translate. A lot of um, research that has been done is done in uh, in the Russian language, and uh, in order for my children at least and my grandchildren to um, get access and people here in Toronto and North America to get access, we we should be translating all that research and all those books to English and Hebrew. And uh, and that's also one of the projects that um, hopefully we'll be initiating with uh, with this organization. And also collecting stories, all those stories, memories, pictures, um, collecting them and having all these artifacts uh, preserved um, for generations to come. Wow, so documenting, preserving, and teaching the language and culture is what you're you're interested in. Yes, absolutely. And okay. uh, I love what they, um, just this past Friday, by the way, August 16th was uh, the anniversary of uh, Rimizi Hasaba's uh, foundation. They founded the Red Village um, 290 years ago. It was actually established. Uh, Jura were there beforehand, but uh, they actually established that city then and they celebrated. They have a Jewish museum in the city now. They have uh, at least three synagogues and a Beit Midrash, a place to study Torah. And uh, and that's that's some place that my children and our great, ch great children and people, uh, Jewish people in North America should be visiting. So- um, have, have, you, have you visited there? My parents have. Um, I'm, it's on my bucket list, definitely. Um, not uh, later, <laughs> sooner than later, absolutely. <laughs> wow, okay, so, and yeah, let's talk a little bit more about Rimrizi Rasaba. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is a very unique town because it's one of the few towns in the world, out, it's, I think, the only town outside of Israel and the US that's an all Jewish town. Mm -hmm. And so to your knowledge, how many people currently live there? I would say um, about 3,000 people who are completely Jewish. Um, a lot of the younger um, Jews who used to live there left their homes and are kind of into the big cities, but they do own homes. So it's kind of, they have cottages and they go during the summertime to, uh, to Ruba. Um, but I would say definitely under 4,000 4, for sure. And so people have moved to other towns and, and cities in Azerbaijan. Have people also left for Israel and elsewhere? Yes. So um, so uh, when my uh, parents left, I was in the early 70s and people were living in secrecy to Israel. Uh, but a lot, a lot left. They they sold everything. They sold all these mansions that they used to have, and and lots of land. And my my grandfather, um, from my mom's side, used to have this vast land, and he used to grow produce, fruits, and vegetables, and used to sell them. Um, and my mother remembers that as a child, um, how hard it was to leave that space, that place that they used to call home. But at the same time, they were so excited to make a make Aliyah to Israel because they were always speaking about this Zionist dream of returning home to the Holy Land. Um, yeah. And do your children hear stories of Remizi Rasaba? Yes. So my grandparents tell a lot of stories about their own childhood. Uh, they tell about going to school and, uh, you know, the same things that, uh, that kids... Um, you know, when they're nine and 10 years old have, uh, but in different different uh, space and time, they used to say that how how uh, scared they were when it was parent-teacher night because uh, 
they um they didn't want their parents to come home and you know be disappointed just like just like any child who's uh, you know is about to re report car time and uh, their parents are supposed to go and visit the teacher and they're like a little bit anxious about uh, about their marks and so on uh they say story about that my parents do talk about um how hard it was living during communist time because uh, um, there were a lot of restrictions and um, and the, my grandfather, the grandparents always had to be very weary of their areas and their space um, because they were Jews. And, um, and also they talk about uh, stories from, from uh, my grandparents when my grandparents were were children because my grandparents were basically children of the war, Second World War. Um, my both my grandparents uh, grew up without their fathers because they lost their fathers uh, to to the Second World War. Both of them were fighting in the Soviet Army, and uh, they did anything they could. All the men in the in the village. Um, enlisted in the army and made sure that no Nazis uh, would be entering the village and some of them um, paid with their lives, but um, the Nazis did not, did not reach Ramzi Hasaba. And mm -hmm. all of that is because of their bravery. So there, there's a lot of stories. Definitely. Wow, so that's the kind of story that you'll hope to collect with your organization. Absolutely. Wow. Yes. Um, what about music? You mentioned that you want this organization to include song. Is there, um, are there specific songs that you sing to your children? Oh, there's one song about children. Um, I'm going to try singing it. I'm a terrible singer. So don't take me uh, for, for singing as a, I'm just going to try singing it because for learning purposes, it's uh, the song for children and it's called, uh, it, and it goes like this. Itchukla aila bala laimuni, shirina aila bala laimuni. And as you can see, those are the words that I use to call my children, shirina bala. Uh, and ail, ail means a child. And uh, it talks about a small child and, uh, and about the child being naughty <laughs> and being confident, but at the same time, the sweetest. <laughs> So it's a, uh, it's a, oh, I love that song. My favorite, definitely. Do you know if there's a recording of that online? There should be. Um, I can find, <laughs> I can definitely find. Oh, that's great. So when you send that to me, we'll post that on the Juhuri slash Judeo Tot page of the Jewish language website. Okay. And, and hopefully we can add other songs as well. We do have some, some songs and some, um, clips of Juhuri theater on our mm -hmm. website. And, um, but we also want to come up with a larger list of words of heritage words that have been passed down the generations, even to people who don't speak any Juhuri and whose native language is English. Um, I think you might have a few more words on your list. What other words, you haven't mentioned anything about food. Do you have any food words on there? Oh, wow. Um, I must say, I know you have Rorol. Rorol is on on uh, the Jewelry lexicon on your website. Um, but I'm going to say Eshkena, which is also a Passover dish. Uh, Eshkena is basically taking the center plate and putting it in a soup. <laughs> so oh, <wow. laughs> pretty much. And uh, so it, it's very tasty to eat Rorol with Eshkena on Pesach. Um, or nisoni, um, as as we say, in uh, in jewelry, and um, my my kids' favorite dish is uh, oshie uh which is a dish. Um, it's uh, it's basically a bed of rice and uh, a stuffed cabbage, <laughs> and uh, the stuffed cabbage is with meat, rice, uh, with cilantro onions and and some spices it tastes very very good and it's it's uh it's also cooked in um uh, in a special tamarind sauce so it's kind of the meat is kind of sweet and the tamarind sound is sour it's a very unique taste and uh, i 
haven't seen it anywhere else. The Oshapari of Juro is very unique, and it's uh, and it's something that that my children definitely love. And they refer to it with that word, right? They refer to it Oshapari. It's not called anything else. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and I think that's pretty common in words in heritage words to include several names of dishes because those dishes are distinct mm -hmm. and so you need distinct names to refer to them what about euphemisms or body parts or words for going to the bathroom do you have any words <laughs> like that that you use in your family um i can start with let's start with the with the head ser <laughs> Um, when you say you have a headache, Serma <laughs> Adi um, And that's something that your kids would know? They would say it in, in such a funny way, but they know what it means. <laughs> they would say it with, uh, you know, a Canadian accent. But it's, again, it's so sweet. And the fact that they're actually saying it, it's great, even though it's kind of means like a joke for them. But um, they are using the word. So, yes, <laughs> they know. Wow. Okay. And what else? Um, let me see. What else do they know? Kemer, which means the back. Shuram is a stomach. Des, hand. Uh, poi is a leg. Poyo, legs. Now there's singular and plural <laughs> when it comes to limbs now. Chum, chumo. Vini, nose. Laa is a mouth. Um, zoon, which means a tongue. Wow, so your kids really know a lot of vocabulary. Yes, basic, but they know. They know how to use it. Yes. Wow. That's why but they're picking up on the language. <laughs> so we wow. can't keep it in secrecy. Uh, yeah, I think your family is unique in preservation of this language because I think a lot of people in your generation Ha well, first, it probably also has to do with when they left, because I think people who remained in Azerbaijan or Dagestan are more likely to have picked up Russian as their primary language, right? Yeah, yes, uh, they have. And um, and I think we're kind of lucky that we preserved the Juhuri as much as possible. And uh, Russian was not as dominant as... Um, as a Turkish Azerbaijan uh, was. Um, and and I think that we left also um, Ruba in, in a good time, the 70s, where we could actually have that preserved Juhuri rather than have the Russian dominant over. Right, and so your husband's family has more Russian than your family. Yes, my, my husband speaks uh, very fluent Russian and um, he, yes, absolutely. In the family, they speak more Russian than Jewry. Although the, um, let me see, I think between the brothers and sisters, they speak Jewry, uh, but my husband is more, I think he's comfortable with Jewry more, I would say. But they do speak Russian as well in the house. And Where, yeah. Whereas my parents did not speak um, did not speak Russian as much in the house, but his family did. Mm -hmm. And then what about Azerbaijani, which is also known as Azeri or Azeri Turkish or Turkic, uh, you know, Azeri. Um, to what extent does your family speak that? You mentioned earlier that they speak some, but do they ever use it at home? Uh, Azeri, no, they don't use it at home, but it's funny. They would use it when... Um, they would use that language when they watched their Turkish telenovelas, <laughs> which is they understand the language. They they um, it's a language needs to be practiced, and that's how they practice it. Both my parents can have a conversation in Turkish or in Azeri uh, with native people from Azerbaijan or from Turkey. My husband is not. He would understand a few words here and there from what he remembers from school but he would not be able to speak um, Azeri Turkish. And what about you? Um, no, <laughs> I would, I, I understand some, um, but it's not a language that um, has been, um, I've been practicing. 
I would watch sometimes telenovelas in Turkish with my parents and they would have to translate most of the of it. But um, I understand some words, not the language though, not the whole language. So it seems that your family is really doing a lot to preserve this culture, both in your family and in your plans to start an organization that will that will preserve it. Um, do you know of others that are doing similar work, other families that are passing this language down to their children? Um, I know that from my circle of family, they're they're trying. My sister, for instance, my my brothers are trying. Uh, the kids, because they're getting older, they're very curious also about their their heritage and their roots. So they start asking questions. So when the kids ask questions, you're kind of going back and you're trying to uh, kind of reteach yourself uh, about the language, but also understand the importance of it. And if they're curious, um, you you also want to research and find out what can I give, what can I give them so so they know more. Um, so I would say in my family, yes, um, there are some projects happening in Israel. There are projects as yourself as your organization happening to preserve the language, but not enough. And I think initiating this uh, this project, this organization, would actually. I think light, a light bulb maybe, um, maybe some sort of uh, curiosity or how important it is to shed light and to raise awareness towards preserving the language. Are you involved with any uh, Facebook groups? Um, for, I think I follow some, but I'm not, um, not acting. So I think there's a Facebook group group called Kavkazi Jewish History and Culture. Are you part of that one? I'm not sure if I am. I know that I follow a couple, but I need to go back. If Facebook is not exactly um, a social media platform that I put a lot of attention to, but I should. Yeah, that's probably smart. Um, but I wonder if there are networks of people, and I know there's different names for Juhuro people like Kavkazi and Mountain Jews. Um, it seems like you've been using the term Juhuro. That's the term you prefer? Yes, we used to use Kafkazit, but um, as children, uh, but as we grew older, I understood that Kafkazit is so broad, the Kafkaz mountains are so broad, it's so broad uh, that we need to be very specific. And uh, that's when I started and we started using Juhuri at home. And previously, were you referring to the language as Judeo-taught? No, nope, Judeo-taught is something you taught me, actually. So ah. I, knew, I knew of Juhuri, but I did not know of Judeo-taught until I, I found you, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably a more academic term. But, you know, we like to use the terms that are used within the communities themselves. So... Let's stick with Chuhuri. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I, I wonder, I mean, it seems there are probably people similar to you who are maintaining some heritage words through the generations from Juhuri. And, you know, I think when people connect with each other, they're more likely to have the resources they need and, you know, share their experiences in new ways. So, uh, you know, we're happy to help at the Jewish Language Project to connect people to each other. I'm looking forward to that. Absolutely. So what else? What else do you want to tell us about your uh, identity, community, and language? Um, that it's it's so rich and it's um and I think it's so important to preserve it because um it brings out this beautiful multiculturalism that is Judaism. Judaism is this tapestry of all these weaving um, threads of people coming from all over the world. And I know that it's important that, especially moving to Israel, being Israeli is very important. And we kind of became a melting pot rather than celebrating our kind of, our colors. But, um, in order to preserve the uniqueness of the Jewish community and in order to celebrate our the uniqueness of our various, very diverse identities, uh, let, let us work a little harder to preserve 
those uh, those histories and those heritage and those beautiful stories that um, just waiting there to be to be told. Amen. That's exactly what we're hoping to do. And we hope that this podcast sparks people to get involved. If anybody wants to get involved with the organization that Ilana Mansharov is hoping to start, they can contact us at jewishlanguages.org and we'll put you in touch. And if anybody has additional words that they'd like to add from Juhuri to the Jewish English lexicon or the Jewish Russian lexicon, we have other lexicons in other languages as well, then uh, they can do that at our website as well. And uh, I want to end by saying Sochboshi. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for, for sharing all of this uh, wonderful information and the wonderful work that you're doing. Thank you very much, everyone. And Hodokumek, as we say.